Hey, good morning. Wasn't it a beautiful day in the Ozarks? I don't know if it is where you were listening. Welcome to those who are listening online. It's a beautiful day here. And it's also uh, great to be getting back to normal today. Amen, church? Get to do our belong groups afterwards. And um, we get, want you to do what's c- comfortable. So you social distance as you are comfortable with and so on. And um, I had the, the honor of preaching a wedding last night for some very dear friends. And there was no social distancing whatsoever yesterday evening. <laughs> but it was fun. It was a blast. Um, some good friends, beautiful weather, an outside wedding, and, and it's just a beautiful time, beautiful weekend for all of that. We're in Matthew chapter 5, so turn there if you haven't already, as we continue our series through the Beatitudes. It's called the B series, um, as each of these are attitudes of being. We are, um, we practice, I should say, what we really are, and so our attitudes are revealed in our actions and our words, and so this is the B series, and the message is titled today, our last B attitude, Be Persecuted. Be Persecuted. What kind of title is that? <laughs> I mean, who wants that? John MacArthur wrote a commentary on this particular verse, or these verses, and he titled that chapter, Happy Are the Harassed. I mean, when Jesus was giving these beatitudes, at, when he, he's, this is a sermon, by the way. He's preaching this three-chapter sermon here. Did he somehow lose his sermon notes when he got to this one? Because it be persecuted. What in the world? It's the most surprising beatitude of them all and contrary to worldly desire, the most contrary to worldly desire of all the rest of them. I mean, if you think about it, the world doesn't believe humility brings joy at all. It doesn't associate joy with brokenness over sin. It doesn't associate joy with meekness. The world does not associate um, joy with mercy. How much less would it and does it associate joy with persecution? But listen to me carefully. You cannot be a genuine Christian without experiencing persecution. In case you didn't catch me, let me say that again. You cannot be a genuine Christian without experiencing persecution. That's not Derek's opinion. That's what the Word of God said. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. In fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Did you see that? All who wish to follow Christ genuinely will be be persecuted. You cannot be a genuine Christian without experiencing persecution. Persecution does not make you a Christian any more than the other Beatitudes we've already studied, but just like all of the other Beatitudes, it is a, it's a characteristic of a follower of Christ. It is a mark, a char- the character trait of a genuine believer, and it's one of the most trying tests. Jesus promises blessing to those who are persecuted. Remember, blessing means an inner contentment, a a joy on the inside that is experienced and maintained regardless of circumstances. Jesus promised that to those who are persecuted. So we obviously need to unpack this thing and find out what does it mean. The beatitude is slightly different than the previous seven as well. You'll probably notice. The first seven are the characteristics of a genuine believer, follower of Christ, his or her being, what the believer looks like, what the believer acts like, what the believer talks like, thinks like, all of those things because of the change that Christ has made in that person's life. The last beatitude describes the result of living out the previous seven. If you live the previous seven, then you're going to be experiencing this one. But I also want you to notice all, that it, it too is a still an attitude. It's the attitude of being willing to endure persecution and in fact, as Jesus said, to rejoice in it. Now this beatitude immediately follows the peacemaker on purpose. So let's review them one more time as we get to this last one. So Jesus, verse 2, opened his mouth and began preaching. He said, blessed are the poor. When I am face to face with with this poor in spirit, not poor monetarily, though that's okay too. But he's talking about the poor in spirit. It means that when I'm face to face with God, when I realize who he am, I recognize my helplessness. 
with regard to him. I, I am in desperate need of him. Someone who recognizes they're in desperate need of him is poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. When I recognize who God is, then I see myself for who I am, and I see the sin in my life compared to his holiness, and I am broken over that sin, and not only my sin, but the sin of others around me, the sin of our culture, the sin of our world, and I repent of my sin. Blessed, he said, are the meek. When I am broken over my sin, my pride is removed, and that's what meekness really is talking about. Pride is removed and I submit. It's a submission to his control. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I desire then to be emptied of my sin and filled with his righteousness because what I think is righteousness, I mean, my good works, my good deeds done in my flesh are worthless in his sight. I can't do anything holy and righteous and good in the eyes of the Lord unless he does them through me. I want to be filled with his righteousness. I hunger for that. And as he fills me, some things begin to happen. In other words, some results of that filling are that, blessed are the merciful. I desperately see how much I am in need of God regularly, in need of his mercy. In turn, I see that others need mercy too. Blessed are the pure in heart. God changes me and cleanses me, which brings peace between me and him, and therefore peace with others. Blessed are the peacemakers. Since I have now been cleansed, having been brought to peace with God, my heart has changed, and I want to help others find peace with God as well. Blessed are the persecuted. Because I live out and share the gospel so that others might find peace with God, I have to confront sin and call others to humility, and then when I do that, I am persecuted. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your servant is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets, or your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I have a book in my office that's very humbling to read. It's called Fox Book of Martyrs. It was, its first edition was written in 1563 by the Protestant historian John Day, and it's a, it includes a history of followers of Jesus Christ who were persecuted unto death for their faith in Jesus and living out that faith. It's been edited several times over the last 300 years, but today there are more Christians persecuted than since, our first, than since the first century. It's more persecution today than there was in the first century. Now, there have been horrific times of extreme persecution, as you know, if you know church history. But most of those times were localized to particular places. But now as Christianity has grown worldwide, listen, persecution is worldwide. It's far more widespread and far more often. Persecution does not mean one has to be executed, one has to be killed for their faith, though that is arguably the most extreme. Persecution means suffering, and it comes in many forms that both Jesus as well as other writers in Scripture recognize as persecution. One may be burned at the stake, yes, but one may also lose a job or lose a friend. Everything from losing one's freedom to verbal abuse, backstabbing, malice, imprisonment, prejudicial treatment, on and on the list goes. So as with each of our Beatitudes, there is just one point in the message. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why are followers of Christ persecuted? What is the reason? Jesus qualifies it, <clears throat> explains the reason. Did you see it? Why are followers of Christ persecuted? He says, for what? For righteousness' sake. It does not say, blessed are the persecuted, period. It says, blessed are the persecuted, what? For righteousness' sake, it's qualified. Persecution, of course, is suffering, And some suffer because they've done something wrong. That's called punishment, not persecution. 1 Peter 4, verse 15, None of you, however, should suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. 
So it doesn't just mean suffering. It doesn't just mean persecution. That's not what he's talking about is going to be blessed. Neither is it about suffering persecution for being zealous. He didn't say blessed are those who are persecuted for zealousness. Being a fanatic about something can lead to persecution, but that's not what Christ blesses. We are to be wise as serpents and harmless as what? Doves. Some people selfishly pursue persecution. In other words, that look at me having to suffer because of who I am, what I've done, and what I've said, or yeah, whatever. Some, strangely enough, actually pursue that. Look at me having to hurt because of this. Jesus doesn't bless that either. It's vain pride, actually. It doesn't mean suffering persecution for being religiously political. Pay attention. Just because we have a cause that we think is worth suffering for doesn't mean it will be blessed. One of our biggest problems, at least in our culture, is our constant temptation to wed our religion to our political preferences. What I mean by that is we have trouble separating our political preferences from spiritual principles. Jesus was not a member of a political party or a social organization. It doesn't mean suffering for being a good person. Good people may suffer, yes. But that's not what Jesus is describing here. Good people are often identified as noble, nice folks. And that's, and that's good, and, and that true, may, may be very true. But listen to me, if their popularity is because they never confront sin or never mention God, then they have no guarantee of blessing here. A Christian may suffer any of those things, but there's no promise of blessing from God for suffering for any of those things. And anyone can suffer any of those things and not even be a genuine believer at all. Non-believers can do good and be noble and have a cause. But that's not what it says. What then does this mean? What does this verse mean? What does he promise blessing to? Blessed are those who are persecuted, once again, for what? For righteousness. What does righteousness mean? Righteousness means to divide. That's what the word literally means, to divide. You know why Christians are persecuted? Because they are divisive. (laughs) What, preacher? Are we supposed to be nice? (laughs) Well, you didn't say we're supposed to be mean, but we're still divisive. What does it mean? It means they're different. It means believers are ones, genuine believers are ones who separate light from darkness, who separate truth from lie. I don't mean that we're abrasive. I don't mean that we're abusive. I doesn't mean that we're mean or hateful. I just mean that our life should exhibit, as Jesus is going to, go, is going to say in the next few verses, salt and light. And salt is good, right? It preserves. But salt stings the wounds of sin. And light is good. Because light shows the way, but light also reveals the things that are hidden in darkness. Righteousness is confrontational. It stands in opposition to Satan and the world that he is running. John MacArthur says, those born only of the flesh will persecute those born of the Spirit. Ultimately, being righteous is being like Jesus. If you are righteous and you've just humbled yourselves and prayed and hungered for, to be filled with the righteousness of Christ, then you are, righteousness means, means being like Christ. So ultimately what this means is you are being persecuted for being, for being like who? For being like Christ. That's the promise. Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you're persecuted for being like me. In fact, John chapter 15, Jesus said, beginning in verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love, its, love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. <laughs> Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. It is being persecuted for being 
what? Righteous. For, being, for, for, for doing what's right, specifically for, for, for being like Christ. <clears throat> Look at the end of chapter 5, verse 11. Jesus qualifies it once again. Blessed are those when, they, when you were persecuted. You see the last phrase? On my account. Brothers and sisters, the world hates Jesus. The world hates Jesus. Now, the world loves baby Jesus. Right? He's just a baby. The world loves baby Jesus, and we know that. Why? Because the world stands around a Christmas tree every year and celebrates materialism. That's why I love baby Jesus, because it gets stuff. Hello? But the world hates Savior Jesus. Because Savior Jesus calls us to humility and repentance. Asks us to cast off pride and submit fully to Him. That's why the world... And you know why the world hates Jesus? Because the world loves sin. Jesus was not persecuted because He was good. He was good, but He wasn't persecuted for being good. Jesus was not persecuted because... He was a fanatic. Jesus was not persecuted because he promoted himself. Do you know why Jesus was persecuted? Because he was different. His holy life revealed a difference between their sinful life. There was a contrast. That's why he was persecuted. There's some things to remember. One of which is this. We are not to seek persecution. In other words, this is something we ask for. It's not something we desire. It's not something we hunger for. <clears throat> you hunger for righteousness, but not the persecution that comes with it. We don't seek it. Seeking righteous, seeking, excuse me, persecution is veiled pride. We aren't to be intentionally offensive. We're not to be parading around hoping somebody will throw rocks at us. But if we're truly like Jesus, then yes, we will be persecuted. Now, Jesus used the, the word when. He's in verse 11, blessed are those when this happens. Which means what? What well, means it doesn't indicate it's going to happen constantly. This isn't a consistent thing. For some people it may be, depending on where you live and what time you live in and what culture you're in. So it, it might be consistent, but it isn't a promise that it has to be. But it does indicate that it will be. In other words, no matter where you're at, no matter what culture you're in, at some point it will happen. The perfect Christian is not the super nice guy that never offends anybody, never says anything that's not politically correct. It's not the popular guy that everyone loves because the nice guy is the guy who tolerates everything. That's not, that's not the perfect Christian. The genuine Christian is not popular with everyone. Let me say that again. A genuine Christian cannot be popular with everyone because the genuine Christian looks like Jesus and Jesus is not popular with everyone. Luke chapter 6, verse 26 says, Woe to you when all people speak well of you for their fathers did to the false prophets. Did you check that out? Did you hear what he says? Woe to you when all people speak well of you. Something's wrong when all of them are speaking well of you. Sometimes that persecution comes from the outside world. That, that's expected, and it's pretty common. We know that, right? Christians are portrayed by the media and Hollywood as ignorant, bigots, uneducated, who are out of touch with reality. Isn't that true? Is that not how we're portrayed? But sometimes, I mean, we expect persecution there, by the way, or we, we should, But sometimes persecution comes from religious people. Why? Well, because not everyone who claims a religious devotion is sincerely walking with Christ. For some, it's just religious activity, not genuine faith. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Formal Christianity is often the greatest enemy of pure faith. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? Formal Christianity is often the greatest enemy of pure faith. 
The more common persecution, at least in our culture, for Christians usually comes from within their own church, from within their own family, and even and from their friends. Why? Because those who, whose compromised form of Christianity is confronted most by the holy life of a genuine believer near them. The form of persecution one may suffer is often dictated by the circumstances that surround it or the relationship he or she has with the persecutor. And if you look in the scripture here, Jesus kept it simple. Blessed are those who revile you, persecute, persecute, or persecute you, or utter, utter all kinds of false things um, because of me. Revile, persecution, or speak evil of is basically what that means. It, it involves what? Physical abuse, verbal abuse, and emotional abuse. We have brothers and sisters all over the world who will disappear today. This will be the last day anybody knows where they're at because of their faith. We have brothers and sisters around the world today who will be, be formally executed today. On this worship day, there are the, the folks who will find them and execute them today. Today. That's going to happen in this world somewhere, because it happens every day, but especially on Sundays. But some believers will lose their job or their promotion. They will endure sneers and jokes when they enter a room. Some believers will become victims of a cold war. The question is for us, I think, regarding application is how, how, do we, how do we deal with it? How, do we, how does a follower of Christ respond to persecution? Now, the simple answer, but yet also the hard answer, is basically this. We respond to persecution like, like who? Like Christ. If we're being persecuted because we're like Christ, then we ought to respond to persecution, right? Like Christ. The persecution of the believers because they are like Jesus. And what is the persecution meant to do? What's Satan after? Why why is he driving the persecution from wherever it's coming from? Because he wants to get the believer to betray his or her allegiance to Jesus, to switch horses in midstream. It's the same thing Satan tried to do with Job. Look, God, Job's only faithful to you because things are going great. But I tell you what, make it go bad and he'll curse you. That's what persecution's for. And that's exactly what Satan did to Job. So the answer, of course, in response to it, ultimately, is then to do what? Not to switch horses in midstream, not because I'm being persecuted now, I deny God, but instead to act like Christ. Who maintains his integrity. I quoted Pastor Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous pastor, earlier. When he preached on these verses several years ago, he offered some practical advice, and and they're good. They're really good. I want to share them with you. Some things that we can do in response to persecution or remember. So let me share them with you. The Christian, first of all, must not retaliate to persecution. The Christian must not retaliate to persecution. What's that mean? It means that the Christian doesn't reply in the flesh. See, here's what the flesh, the flesh desires retaliation. It wants to punch back. But the believer's different. Why? Because the believer's no longer controlled by the flesh. The believer's been changed. The believer's follow, if the believer, the genuine believer is the Beatitudes here. So life characterized by the Beatitudes, which involves involves what? Poor in spirit, which is humility, mourning over sin, being meek, that's strength under control, and merciful, on and on we go. It doesn't mean that the one suffering does not desire or even seek justice. In fact, they do. That's righteousness. It just simply means they don't seek vengeance. There's a difference. The Christian, secondly, must not feel resentment. Now, the previous application applies to action. This application applies to attitude. Resentment is the root of bitterness. It's not saying that the one who is being persecuted is supposed to deny the hurt. That's impossible. It hurts. 
What's it saying? It's saying that person who is being persecuted doesn't hold on to the hurt. They do not let the hurt control them. Why? Because healing comes when? Ultimately, when we surrender our pain to God and ask Him to take care of it as the perfect judge the way He so chooses. When we seek Him to fix it rather than doing it ourselves. The Christian, thirdly, must not be depressed. What's that mean? Well, the last application was directed at an individual, the resentment piece. This one has kind of to do with the overwhelming oppression the believer feels over their soul. Man, you, you know it. You've been there. Why me? Why is this always happening to me? Why now? Why? I mean, it, whatever, etc. So it leads to an, and here's what, here's what it does. Here's how Satan uses that. It leads to an overwhelming temptation for the believer to quit walking with the Lord. In other words, if I've got to endure this because I'm walking with Jesus, and I don't want to walk with Jesus. And that's sinful logic. But that's not what Christ commands. What did Jesus say? Verse 12. He commands the opposite. What did he say to do? Oh, read it. It's in your Bible. Verse number 12. What's the first thing he says? Do what? When you're persecuted, do what? Has he lost his marbles? He really lost his sermon notes on this one. He's just making it up on the fly. No, he's not. What, what is he? What's going on? Rejoice. Be glad. <clears throat> the, the Greek word, you know what it means? It means jump up and down excited. It's literally what it means. <laughs> Yay! This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, got to park on that one a minute, don't you? It's like, this is just not logical. But listen to me. Every single one of the Beatitudes are not worldly logical. Blessed for being humble. Blessed for being broken and repentant. Blessed for, I mean, none of them are logical. Why would this be any different? Because the kingdom doesn't work the way the world works. And we've got the world, even as believers, so ingrained in us, we sometimes lose complete sight of what it means to live for the kingdom. Rejoice <clears throat> seems impossible. Listen to me. For the lost person, for the unbeliever, it is impossible. Only those who are walking in the previous seven Beatitudes can do it because they are all fruits of the Spirit. Only the Spirit of God can make this possible for you, can give you strength to do it. Let us... Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Now look at this last phrase. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Pastor Chuck Swindoll wrote this. He says, It's a dogged determination to pursue holiness when the conditions of holiness are not favorable. It's a choice in the midst of our suffering to do what God has asked us to do, whatever it is, and for as long as He asks us to do it. And then he quotes Oswald Chambers, who wrote, To choose suffering makes no sense at all. To choose God's will in the midst of our suffering makes all the sense in the world. Christians don't rejoice for persecution or for the fact of it. We rejoice in it, but not for it. Now, why do we not rejoice for persecution? Because of beatitude number two. What's beatitude number two? Brokenness over sin. My sin and the sins of those around me. What causes persecution? Sin. Sin is persecution. Persecution is sin. It's where it comes from. So I don't rejoice for the persecution. That would be rejoicing for someone's sin. The sin of the one persecuting me. So I don't rejoice for it. I rejoice in it. That's different. Someone is being enslaved by sin and Satan. I don't rejoice for that. Why then do I rejoice? Because persecution reminds us 
of our salvation. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is what? <clears throat> theirs is what? Look at the phrase. It's what? The kingdom of heaven. That's the last beatitude. Look at the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? Do you notice it's the same promise? The bookends. It's the bookends. That's our home. What does, he say? what does he say? He's saying, you're being persecuted for righteousness. Righteousness is a genuine mark of a believer. Persecution is being like Jesus, or is for, is for being like Jesus. So you're being persecuted because you belong to Christ. You're being persecuted because you're saved. Rejoice in that. In what? Not for the, for the persecution. Rejoice in your salvation. Your persecution just reminds you that you are. What else? Why else do we rejoice? Jesus says, because persecution reminds you of who you're associated with. He says in the end of verse 12, rejoice. Why? Also, your reward is great in heaven, and also because you're so were the, pro- the prophets were persecuted. Well, you know what Jesus is saying? Hey, if you're persecuted, you're in good company. I mean, you share ranks with Moses. He was persecuted. With David. With Jeremiah. So you share ranks with them. You're right there with them. You sit side by, so- side, by side in persecution with Peter and Paul, James and John. You're in the same category with him. You're in the category of Hebrews chapter 11. What's Hebrews chapter 11? We'll read that sometime. It's a long chapter. It's really good. It's all about those who are persecuted for the faith. The heroes of the faith, and, they were all, and most of them were persecuted, many unto death. And they are called the heroes of the Bible. He says, when you're persecuted, you share ranks with them. You're right with them. Jesus is saying, look, that's your company. That's your team. Rejoice, why? Because it reminds you of your heavenly home. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great. Where? In heaven. I'm sick of this world. It's a train wreck. I mean, God's beauty is everywhere. (laughs) But man, humanity has monkeyed it up. Hello? I'm kind of sick of us a lot of times. (laughs) Wow, it's busted. And it is. It's broken and busted with sin that is growing worse all the time. Have you noticed? Man, is it ever getting worse. Jesus said it would. So did the apostles. Paul himself said, boy, before it comes, it's going to get a lot worse than this. That's what he said back then. So did Jesus. On the one hand, as the worse it gets, the more I hate it and want to go home. John said, even so, Lord, come quickly. And on the other hand, the worse it gets, the more I think we're getting closer to home. Because they said it was going to get a lot worse before before he came to get us. We rejoice because of our heavenly home. Now, all of those, all believers who are persecuted will be rewarded in this life. Listen to me. You'll be rewarded in this life for persecution, but not necessarily with worldly things. Some might be if Jesus so chooses. But all believers will be rewarded in this life with peace, joy, contentment, and the assurance of God's presence that He is with you no matter what happens. That's in this life. But also... Every persecuted follower of Christ is rewarded in heaven. What is that going to be? I don't have no clue, but it's got to be cool. If we're getting it in heaven, if he's saving it for there, it's beyond our description. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard 
And that which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. I, I like the last phrase best. <clears throat> what he's going to reward us with, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, you hadn't seen it yet, you hadn't heard about it, and you can't even think it up. No matter how hard you try and you put the highest theological think tank together that you possibly could, you still ain't going to touch it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Paul said, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For the genuine believer, our whole outlook on life is to be governed and focused on this truth. What truth? Well, folks, listen, if we are not driven by, the, by, by that eternal destiny, then we are far too focused on worldly things instead of kingdom things. If, I, if we're not driven by our homecoming in glory through everything we deal with in life, then we are far too focused on the temporal junk that's here. Our <clears throat> reward, whatever it is, we know it includes some things. Unlimited joy. Man, I can't wait for that. The pure and holy wonder of being in the glorious presence of Jesus Christ in heaven. We know it includes that. We know it includes this. That we will be glorified. And you, listen, and guys, your hair is not going to fall out anymore. (laughs) ladies you will not have to worry about your dress size ever again 300 might be the perfect weight in heaven (laughs) kingdom's different in the world hello I promise you God's not taking his cues from Victoria's Secret models he loves them too and he loves you Do you know what the best part is? Never again, ever again will we be tempted to sin. Man, I can't wait for that. Never, ever again one tempting thought. We know it includes that. Whatever else the other stuff is, that's cool. God can make it whatever He wants. I'm sure it's going to be awesome. But just knowing that, and that's fact, is worth it. This sin-sick world will be no more. We long for the day when Christ will take us home. When He will end sin and death. In the meantime, persecution reveals a divide. The difference between a life of sin and death and a life that's filled with hope and the promise that I will live forever in His glorious kingdom, in His personal presence. Therefore, Jesus says, rejoice. Rejoice, because if you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, On my account, you are being being persecuted because you are one of mine. And one day I'm taking you home. Let's bow together. Are you poor in spirit? 
helplessly recognize your need for the Lord? Are you broken over sin? Blessed are those who mourn. Of your own sin, are you repentant? Are you meek? Meaning what? Not that you're timid, not that you're a pushover, but simply that your pride has been removed and you've submitted to the Lord's control. Your strength is under control. You are strong, but you are under His control. Submitted to Him. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Is your passionate desire to be filled with the righteousness of Christ. Has that produced in you a merciful spirit? Because you desperately need mercy, you recognize others do too. Pure of heart. You have peace with him because he's changed you on the inside. A peacemaker. One who is willing to share the peace of God by sharing the gospel sharing the hope that one has confronting sin when necessary but offering forgiveness to the repentant through the gospel of Jesus Christ blessed are the persecuted are you persecuted and if you have to stand on trial today would there be persecuted evidence that you're a faithful believer maybe you're not being persecuted at the moment but remember it's not a promise of consistency and listen, remember, persecution comes in different forms. It doesn't mean that, well, you know, when you look at the rest of the world, my persecution's light by comparison. Well, persecution comes in a lot of forms. The Lord recognizes them all. Do you know Him? Is it clear by your life that there is a divide? Are you divisive? I don't mean abrasive. I don't mean mean spirited. I just mean divisive in the sense that because you seek to live for Christ, there's a clear difference between your life and those who don't know the Lord. Again, not in a mean spirited way. Or there's a clear difference between your life and those who may profess to follow Christ, but genuinely are not. And humbly you recognize that by God's grace. In fact, you're concerned about that. Lord, I want to be sure that that's the the truth. Because if you recognize it in pride, then you've already failed the very first beatitude, and it's not true. So it's coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, humbly search me, try me, see if there is any wicked way in me. I want this to describe my life. I want to be sure this is what my life looks like, because this is what it looks like to be a follower of you. Search my actions, search my words, search my attitudes. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord today, you can experience that. You say, well, that's a lot of Beatitudes. I mean, i got to do all those things. Well, really, all of those things are really summarized into this. Do you recognize your need before a holy God for Him to change your life? Do you recognize your sin? Do you wish to repent? And It means to change your mind. It means, Lord, I don't want that in my life anymore. I don't want the things that that I know God is not pleased with as part of my life anymore. But I'm helpless to fix it. So I ask God for you to forgive me because Jesus died on a cross for my sins and I want to surrender my life to Him. I trust in the resurrected Jesus Christ as my only hope. If you would tell that to the Lord, then He promises salvation. He promises change. He promises a relationship with you, and an eternal home waiting for you in heaven, if that's the sincere desire of your heart. Share that with him if you need to this morning. I'm going to pray. We'll continue for a few minutes in our time of response. As I do that, I want to uh, to say uh, uh, thank you so much for those of you listening online. We're glad that you were with us today, and if we can be of assistance to you, please email us or give us a call here at Harmony, and we'd love to talk with you. Uh, and, and, and share with you. Thanks again. We'll be back here at 9 o'clock next week. So good, goodbye to all of you online. Have a great day. Let me pray, church family, as we move to our time for response. Father, I, I, I just pray that you would move your spirit among us, Lord. Let, let your spirit search and try our hearts. Let our life be characterized as one that is the mirror of Christ. It's not going to perfectly, it's not, it's just not going to perfectly look like you, Lord. 
that would be sinlessness. <clears throat> but indeed, our lives should seek to sin less, to look more and more like you. So where we may be failing in any one of these beatitudes, I pray, Father, you would point that out to us. Specifically as we...